On July 5th, 1966, a Saturn 1B rocket was launched from Cape Kennedy's Launch Complex 37B. The purpose of the flight was to evaluate the performance of the S-4B stage of the rocket, which was needed to help propel Apollo astronauts to the moon. As development of the Apollo program's hardware kicked into high gear, Project Gemini was getting ready to wrap up. And on June 17, 1966, NASA announced the prime crew for Gemini 12, the final mission of the Gemini program. James Lovell, a Navy captain and veteran of the record-setting 14-day Gemini 7 mission, was named commander for Gemini 12. Joining Lovell on the mission was pilot Edwin Buzz Aldrin. A veteran of the Air Force, Gemini 12 was Aldrin's first space flight. The early planning called for a three-day mission that was to include a rendezvous with an Agena target vehicle and at least two extravehicular activities. One would be a stand-up EVA, and the other would be to evaluate the astronaut maneuvering unit. Since as early as Gemini 4 in June of 1965, NASA had been hard at work to master the techniques needed for an astronaut to perform outside a spacecraft. On June 3, 1965, Gemini 4 astronaut Ed White opened his hatch door and floated out into the vacuum of space, becoming the first American to perform an EVA. By the time White returned to the spacecraft and closed the hatch 23 minutes later, he had made the exercise look easy. America's next attempt at EVA came on June 5, 1966, during the flight of Gemini 9. The EVA called for mission pilot Gene Cernan to exit the spacecraft and move to its rear, where he would strap himself into the astronaut maneuvering unit. The Astronaut Maneuvering Unit, or AMU, was a rocket pack of sorts, which would allow a spacewalking astronaut to maneuver free of the spacecraft. At 10.19 Eastern Standard Time on June 5, 1966, astronaut Gene Cernan left the confines of a spacecraft, becoming the second American to walk in space. Soon, Cernan began making his way toward the rear of the spacecraft to reach the awaiting AMU. Cernan quickly discovered that without the benefit of handholds and footholds, his effort to move around in a gravity-free environment was a struggle. Cernan's pulse rate soon had soared to 195 beats per minute. And to make matters worse, Gemini 9 had now moved into nighttime and Cernan's faceplate had fogged up as he exerted himself maintaining control. The EVA was cut short over concerns for Cernan's safety and following another struggle, he safely returned to the spacecraft. Then, in July of 1966, during the flight of Gemini 10, astronaut Michael Collins became the first person to perform two EVAs during a single mission. The first of those was a stand-up EVA, during which Collins opened the hatch and simply stood up in order to take photographs without actually leaving the spacecraft. 48 hours and 41 minutes into the flight of Gemini 10, Collins again opened the hatch, this time exiting the spacecraft and into the void of space. Like Cernan before him, Collins encountered great difficulty controlling his motion and the EVA was cut short after only 39 minutes. Astronaut Richard Gordon was the next American to try his hand at EVA, this time during the flight of Gemini 11. Unfortunately, Gordon didn't fare much better. How you doing? Tired, Pete. All right, just rest. He had lost sight in his right eye from sweat and rather than risk losing sight in the other, the EVA was cut short after 44 minutes. If America was to achieve the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth, mastery of EVA was essential. Gemini 12 marked the final time NASA would be able to experiment with EVA before the Apollo program, and for the first time, underwater simulation of EVA was incorporated into training for an actual spacewalk. The experience of underwater training gave the effect of working in zero gravity. Mission pilot Buzz Aldrin was suited up and weighted down with 60 pounds of lead before entering a pool to perform tasks similar to those he would perform in space. Aldrin was positioned at a submerged Agena workstation where he attached handholds, used a torque wrench, and made electrical connections. On September 27, 1966, NASA scrapped plans for Aldrin to deploy the astronaut maneuvering unit, preferring instead to focus more attention on developing EVA expertise. Then, nearly one month before the launch of Gemini 12, NASA announced an updated plan for the expected EVAs. 
The first EVA was planned for a two hour and 15 minute period during which Aldrin would open the hatch, stand up, and conduct a series of day and night photographic experiments. Then, during a second EVA planned for an hour and 45 minutes, Aldrin was scheduled to hook up the Agena tether to the spacecraft and carry out basic work tasks like those practiced during underwater training. In a process that took at least two hours, the crew of Gemini 12 suited up and at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on launch day, Aldrin and Lovell were inserted into their Gemini spacecraft perched atop a Titan launch vehicle. Eight minutes later, an Atlas rocket lifted off from Cape Kennedy's Launch Complex 14, boosting the Agena into orbit where it awaited Gemini 12's arrival. At 3.46 p.m., within half a second of schedule, the Titan launch vehicle roared to life and the crew of Gemini 12 were on their way. Roger, right here, you're looking good. Almost dynamic, that all data looks good on the Gemini 12 launch. Once the crew had achieved orbit, the first order of business was to chase down the Agena. Despite difficulties with Gemini 12's onboard radar used to locate the Agena, the crew successfully rendezvoused with the Agena nearly four hours after launch. 28 minutes later, Gemini 12 successfully docked with the Agena, relying heavily on visual sightings due to the radar malfunction. The crew had successfully completed two major objectives of their mission. The first of three scheduled EVAs took place following the first extended rest period of the mission. Buzz Aldrin donned his spacesuit, and 19 and a half hours after liftoff, he opened the spacecraft's hatch door, stood up, and for the next two and a half hours performed a stand-up EVA, during which time he mounted a camera to the side of the spacecraft and collected a micrometeorite package. He also took ultraviolet photographs of various constellations and took standard home pictures for people back on Earth. By the time Aldrin returned to the spacecraft and closed the hatch, he had completed the longest stand-up EVA of the Gemini program. On day two, Aldrin would perform the most ambitious spacewalk of the mission. Unlike the first EVA, this time, after he opened the hatch, Aldrin exited the spacecraft. As he navigated around the Gemini and Agena vehicles, Aldrin availed himself of devices designed to aid in maintaining control over his movement. As Aldrin described it, footholds dubbed golden slippers helped keep his feet in place making hand and body movements very earth-like. Restraining straps worn around his waist, similar to those worn by window washers, worked perfectly. Handrails had been installed, enabling Aldrin to easily work his way between the spacecraft and Agena. Aldrin eventually made his way to the adapter behind the Gemini spacecraft, where he performed ratcheting, bolting, and screwing chores. While working at the adapter, the golden slippers held Aldrin in place, allowing for rest periods to avoid the exhaustion faced by previous Gemini spacewalkers. Throughout the EVA, Aldrin's heart rate remained low, and he never tired from the activity. Two hours and six minutes after it began, the second EVA of the Gemini 12 mission had concluded. By the time Aldrin re-entered the spacecraft, he had performed the most successful EVA of the American space program up to that time. The success of Aldrin's spacewalk established conclusively that if properly equipped, an astronaut can work freely in the space environment. Following undocking from the Agena target vehicle, the third and final EVA of the Gemini 12 mission commenced at 66 hours and 6 minutes ground elapsed time. Once again, Aldrin stood up in the open hatch of the spacecraft, snapping photographs. He also took the opportunity to discard any unwanted hardware from the spacecraft. By the time Aldrin wrapped up the 51-minute EVA, he had set a record for duration of extravehicular activity at 5 hours and 26 minutes. At the conclusion of Gemini 12, Commander Jim Lovell had set a duration record of his own, 
having spent the most time in space for any human up to then, 425 hours, 10 minutes, and 2 seconds. With the EVAs completed, focus turned to completion of onboard scientific experiments and preparation for the upcoming Splashtown set for November 15th. By the time the automatically controlled re-entry sequence began with retrofire at 1.46 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the crew of Gemini 12 had successfully achieved nearly all of the mission's primary goals. They had completed seven experiments and circled Earth 59 times. They had achieved a maximum altitude of 156 nautical miles and had been docked with the Agena for more than a day and a half. Three days, 22 hours and 34 and a half minutes after liftoff and less than four miles from the prime recovery vessel, the aircraft carrier USS Wasp, Lovell and Aldrin splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean. According to Aldrin, the spacecraft hit the water with an impact rougher than most other Gemini flights and soon water had begun seeping into the capsule. Quickly, however, helicopters arrived on scene and discharged divers whose job it was to save the vehicle and its occupants. Within an hour, Lovell and Aldrin were hoisted aboard a helicopter and whisked away to the safety of the Wasp. In addition to establishing man's ability to live and work in space, Project Gemini demonstrated rendezvous and docking capabilities all skills needed to achieve a lunar landing. With 10-man Gemini flights now in the history books, the way had been cleared for Project Apollo.